Okay. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Please, can you hear me? Just to be sure. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. So my name is Dr. Ajay Abuajapong, and I'm the seminar coordinator for the CSPS seminar series, the University of Ghana. Um, we have with us here today, Dr. Victor Sekwejo, who will be giving us a, a, a presentation on decentralization and poverty reduction in Ghana. Thank you all for joining in this session. Um, we'll be starting soon. So Dr. Victor Sekwejo is a governance and institutional development specialist with extensive experience um, researching and working in urban planning, multi-level governance, economics, and public policy. And he's currently um, teaching the MSc public policy course at the University of Maastricht in um, the Netherlands. Um, currently, his research focuses on urban governance cooperation and how interlocal governance cooperation can leverage developmental issues amidst um, rapid urbanization. So he's worked in several countries in Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, Liberia, and recently Cote d'Ivoire, where he's working as an urban governance consultant. He's also worked with the World Bank. Dr. Victor Sekojo, thank you very much for accepting to um, give us this presentation. You have um, 30 minutes to present and then we'll have 30 minutes of Q&A. So thanks and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Japon. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining today. My presentation today is going to be about decentralization and poverty reduction in Ghana. So without wasting more time, I think I can go straight into talk about this particular subject, which is very close to my heart. I'll try to make this section a bit more interactive. So please, um, if you can bear with me, or if you have any questions, you can also drop them in the chat and then we can pick it up late during the uh, Q&A section. So when you talk about decentralization, it basically means um, shifting authority from the national level to local level. There are different forms of decentralization. We have um, delegation, which is like establishing ministries. And then we have deconcentration, which is like establishing units like the passport offices where you can have some in Accra, some in Ashanti region. And then the utmost form of decentralization is devolution. When we talk about devolution, it's actually giving local authorities the power to make decisions and also to lead development. Decentralization has been very well acclaimed as a policy intervention because it kind of opens up um, governance to the grassroots and helps local people to participate when it comes to development. One key aspect when it comes to decentralization is the creation of districts. And this has been very critical and vital to the decentralization agenda. It follows a neoclassical kind of economics, which talks about the fact that if you create more districts, you would be able to facilitate local competition. And when there is competition in basic economics, it leads to efficiency in service delivery. This kind of rationale has led to the decentralization reform in Africa over the past 30 years, and Ghana is no exception. In Ghana, the Decentralization Act or law or process was established with the Local Government Act 1993, which is the Act for Stage 2. And we have a three-tie local government system. That means we have three levels when it comes to development. So we have the national government involved in development, and we have 16 regions that are also involved in development. Our focus today is going to be on the sub-regions, which currently we have 261. Talking about sub-regions, we have three types of sub-regions. So what we commonly know as the assemblies, we have the district assemblies, which have a minimum population of 75,000 people. And then we have municipal assemblies, which have a minimum population of 95,000 people. And then there are metropolitan assemblies like um, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, the um, Tamale Metropolitan Assembly, and they should have a minimum population of 250,000 people. The major source of funding for these district assemblies, district municipal and metropolitan assemblies, is internally generated funds, which come from um, property taxes, tolls, and rates, and even fines that these municipalities kind of um, put in place. The other major source of revenue comes from the district assembly common fund, which is the DACF. 
and that is um, always not less than 5% of the total national revenue, which is distributed among the 261 districts every year. Other forms of revenue include grants, which may come from different external sources, including donor agencies, NGOs, and uh, any other institutions or um, organization that is interested in supporting the local assemblies. So currently we have 261 district assemblies in Ghana. I'll use the term district assembly loosely to refer to metropolitan areas, municipal assemblies, and then district assemblies. We have six metropolitan assemblies. We have 109 municipal assemblies, and then we have 146 district assemblies currently. It wasn't 261 when it started. The decentralization agenda in Ghana started somewhere around in 1988, and then we started with 110 districts. We moved on in 2004 to 138 districts. And then in 2008, we increased to 170 districts. In 2012, we have 216 districts, and this jumped to 260 districts in 2019. Just last year, we added one more district, so currently we have 261 district assemblies. And this means that there has been a 137% increase in the number of districts since we started the decentralization agenda in 1988. Why or what have been the key reason why we've been able to, or we've decided to increase these numbers from 110 to 261? There are some key figures who have led the decentralization agenda. And the major rationale that they've given is that the creation of district facilitates development and poverty reduction by devolving power and confidence and resources to the district level. Also, if we create more districts, it improves administration, it deepens democracy, and also governance of equitable distribution of the national cake. The idea is that with the creation of more districts, there is the chance that we're going to accelerate overall national development. But my question today, or the question that we're going to address today is, if we create more districts, does it in any way reduce poverty at the district level? I believe we all belong to a particular district. So before we go into the details of this, I would want you to give me your opinion on this. If we create more districts, do you think it will reduce poverty at the district level? If you have your phone, um, kindly scan this um, QR code. And then let's try to see if you can participate in this um, brief survey. Also, if you're using a PC, you can easily go to mentimeter.com and then enter this code to be able to participate in this survey. Um, I'll wait briefly so that you can log in. And uh, kindly give me a thumbs up when you're able to log in. Yes, we already have someone in there. I'll wait for at least 10 people to share their opinion before we can move on. Again, if you want to log in, just um, open your camera, scan the QR code, and then it will take you through straight to the survey. Quite interesting to see that now we have more people saying maybe, so it's neither here nor there. Well, that's a good option too. Some few more and then we can move on. It looks like so far nobody believes that if we create more distress is going to lead to poverty reduction. All right, I think we can continue with the polls while we still go ahead with this presentation, but it's quite interesting to see that there's no one in the audience that feels that um, the creation of districts leads to poverty reduction. That has been my argument as well, and I will explain to you in the next couple of slides why I believe so. So there are some key facts when it comes to decentralization. And one of the facts is that when you decentralize, you increase attention and also you're able to kind of secure specific funds like the DACF that can be channeled to the district for development needs of that particular district. That's a fact. Also with the creation of more districts, it enhances participation of citizens because they are closer to the problem. 
So with them having the authority or the district assemblies, they have a direct chance of involving themselves in development decisions. Decentralization also ensures that there's greater accountability of local governments to the populace. And finally, when you create more district, it contributes to political stability through legitimization, not only legitimization, but also shield against any form of um, ethnic kind of divisions that may arise if we keep some districts together. And so creating more districts has been a tool that we've been using to legitimize differences in our local needs and then perspectives. But there are alternative facts here too. When we decentralize, what happens is that we fragment governance in the sense that we create too many authorities. Ideally, if you create too many authorities based on neoclassical economic arguments, it's going to lead to efficiency. But this efficiency will only work when there is competition. Can we say that district assemblies that we have in Ghana are competitive? Also, the decentralization or the district creation that we've been backed on emphasizes more on democracy and then inclusive governance, with less emphasis on the functionality of the district that we create. Are they able to meaningfully develop the district in terms of job creation, in terms of putting up infrastructure, in terms of generally reducing poverty? Also, we do not really have the requisite resource endowment and targeted scrum fairs when we are creating the districts. And when this happens, we feel all inequality because if the metropolitan areas get the um, government distribution based on their size, it's more likely that the rich is going to get richer and then the poor, which are the districts, are not going to escape poverty. Resource endowment and financial transfers are basic conditions for effective decentralization, but this has been ignored in the creation of districts in Ghana. So I argue that the creation of districts, if we disregard the existing and future resource endowment of targeted transfer, is going to create poverty traps that will maintain poverty status quo other than reducing or alleviating poverty. We did a bit of a um, survey and then we found that um, if you look at this graph, there are three colors in here. So you have the red, which represent the metropolitan areas, the blue, which represent the districts, and then the green, which represent the municipalities. What we found was that the metropolitan areas, because they have high IGFs, they have about only 30% of the population in those areas that are poor. The same goes for most of the uh, municipalities, so the municipal assemblies, which are in the green here. But what you realize is that when it comes to the district assemblies, which have low population and which are predominantly rural, and also they happen to be the highest number of um, authorities we have, we have as many as 149. Their poverty situation is beyond the mean. So you have in situations where there are 90% of the population living in districts who are poor. And here by poor, we mean they live under three CDs per day. So in a year, they live under um, around 1,100 CDs per day. This is the situation that we have in districts. And this is the reason why I argue that we should not really go ahead with the creation of more districts if we are not thinking of how we can resourcefully endow them. What we found was that districts that were able to internally generate more funds like the big districts or the big metropolitan areas, they were able to significantly reduce poverty by 3.3%. That is why we argue that it is important that when we establish in these districts, we should be mindful of their potential resource generation abilities. The DSEF, which is the District Assembly Common Fund, is not significant in terms of reducing poverty situations in the um, analysis that we made. So irrespective of the government transfers that goes into these districts, they don't really contribute to poverty reduction. And this can be true, or this is true, because um, we, what we know about the common fund is that it is not really consistent. And also there are a lot of delays. And depending on the amount that comes in, it might go into administrative costs or other interventions in the district, like setting up the district, that may not necessarily lead to um, development interventions that will target poverty alleviation. The downside of district creation is that it's usually created with respect to the population size and the government grants that goes to districts is shared proportional to the population. So we are going to have a situation where we have a situation where the rich becomes rich. So you have the Accra metropolitan areas, the Kumas 
metropolitan areas, the Tamale metropolitan areas, getting huge chunks of the national resources, even though they're also able to generate significant amount of internal revenue. They're going to stay rich or even get richer, but the poor districts who get less because of their size are more likely going to stay poor or they are going to maintain their status quo. So the internal generated fund becomes one of the most important factors or source of income that can be used to leverage development in our districts. However, districts in Ghana are not competitive when it comes to creating avenues for internally generated funds. And they are more reliant or dependent on the externally generated fund, which is the um, government district assembly common fund that comes to them every year. And also it's very inconsistent. So there are two possible traps that I see here. The first trap is a rural trap. Rural trap in the sense that if we create a district, mostly districts are rural. They don't have enough resources or revenue generating resources that they can use to in, um, invest in interventions that will uh, reduce poverty. So what will happen is that these rural areas will remain poor. The best way to escape poverty is to move away to the peri-urban or the urban areas. What happens with this movement is that those who move to the peri-urban and then urban areas also go to put pressure on the existing amenities that you have in the urban and peri-urban areas. So then there becomes a lot of competition between or within these urban and peri-urban areas that leads to high demand and that leads to the kind of high prices that we are seeing in these urban and peri-urban areas. So somebody in the rural area who is poor migrates to the peri-urban or urban area to try to escape poverty and they are faced with even more added poverty because cost of living in the urban and peri-urban areas are outrageously high. So people will be living in the urban areas, but they will be worse off even than people who are living in the rural areas. So what makes um, the creation of uh, districts a poverty trap? The situation is that when you have new districts, they are financially constrained. They have to build their own kind of offices. Most of them, when they are created, rent apartments to operate from, which is no ideal. So they have to look for resources to build their own kind of administration. They have to find staff that they can have to pay well. And uh, with a certain number of these districts, because they are rural, they are not very attractive. So they are not able to attract key staff in there to support their development. And also, because they are rural, there's no substantive economic activities going on there. So their IGF becomes very minimal. The promise of reducing poverty based on what they can generate becomes a bit far-fetched. Also, when competition, which is supposed to be the basis of you know, this, um, decentralization or creating more districts is absent in our districts, you can hardly think of a bit of competition between uh, district assemblies. You know, um, When it comes to development, there is the voting by fit hypothesis where people move to areas where they feel they will get better services. The same cannot be said in our situation. Our districts are not competitive and people do not settle in places based on the kind of um, services or offers that a particular district is offering. Also, the more we decentralize, we miss the economy of scale kind of arguments and the integrated development that we need. There's a lack of horizontal cooperation when we look at our decentralization um, situation. Hardly will you see two or three districts coming together to address a common problem. Think of the flooding situation in Accra. This is not a situation that only affects the Accra metropolitan area. It affects adjoining metropolitan areas who are independent and should be working together with the AMA to address this, but this is not what we are seeing. One other challenge that we see in our district is that they've been given the authority, but this authority has not come with the resources that they need. And they have a um, limited organizational capacity in terms of manning the authority that they have been given. So my argument here is not to discredit the social political benefits of district creation. I mean, you have districts such as the Komenda, Edina, Egrafo, every municipal area. The Asakari Mampon, we all know the uh, story about how the Asakari Mampon uh, metropolitan uh, municipal area was created. The Danfiyama, Busi, and then Isa uh, municipal area. Bebieni, Angmiaso, Bekwai municipal area. Like there are a lot of examples of this that we have. And just by reading the name of it, you realize the kind of compromise that we had to make sociopolitically to be able to have these districts. 
Creating this resource will come with some kind of administrative ease. At least they can assess some kind of administrative services when new districts are established. We can also not discredit the incremental and qualitative benefits in the creation of districts. At least if you build um, a district assembly, that edifice itself is a form of um, attracting investment or a form of attracting some form of um, attention to these particular districts. That said, the quantitative terms in terms of um, uh, what fragmentation brings, it doesn't help districts to move out of poverty. And there are four reasons. The first one is that when we create these districts, they have a low re revenue base, so they don't have significant amount of resources to invest in development. Also, there is too much dependence on the central government transfers and their human resource constraints. They don't really have the capacity to start the management of these um, assemblies. There are also very high administrative costs against development investment, at least in the first five years of establishing these districts, because instead of focusing on development issues, you would have to focus on building an administrative block, which at times takes more than five years to get ready. You know, what I would recommend is that the government can keep creating more districts, but this should be associated with adequate central government transfers. We had a recent study which is published in the World um, Development Journal, and we find that when you have central government grants or funds given to the districts in time and then in uh, significant values, they have multiplier effects that improve local government um, per capita expenditure and leads to development. But other than creating more districts, there is an alternative that I prefer or that I will suggest or that I align with. The Ministry of Local Government, the executive branch of government and the legislature should make our districts more competitive and more accountable. This we can do by the government opting for the election of the managers of our districts. So we should try to push the agenda of um, making our mayors elected mayors other than political appointment. The Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Local Government can also or should also continue introducing more substantial competitive grants. Previously, we had the urban development grant and then the district um, development fund that were being allocated to the district and the municipal metropolitan areas based on some functional assessment in terms of the uh, administrative capacity, their functionality, and then the efficiency. These kind of competitive grants are very important and should be resurrected or they should be continued to kind of stimulate some form of competition between the um, uh, local districts that we have. Also, the Ministry of Local Government and Civil Society should keep promoting the moral competition. It might not only be grants that we can use to stimulate competition within the local um, districts. What we can also do, an example is um, what CDD and then uh, I think UNICEF created, which is the district league table, which measures the performance of district based on uh, some key development criteria like education, like health, like um, access to water and all that. We can create or we can come up with new forms of this kind of uh, um, moral competition between these um, local assemblies so that they would invest and then uh, address the poverty situations that they face in their respective jurisdictions. Also for system-wide and integrated development, there is the need to promote horizontal cooperation among independent districts. This we have a bit of it in the Gamma, which is the Greater Accra Metropolitan Area, where they came together to form GAPTE, um, like a new kind of institutional setup that was used to implement the bus rapid transit. There was also the Greater Kumasi um, approach or agenda, which I think by now has pretty much collapsed. But these are quite very good ideas if you want to achieve holistic development. We should not see district as only independent because right now development issues actually cut across boundaries. So if we think in silos, if we focus on only districts in how they can develop, we are not going to have a coherent kind of development. We are going to have patchworks of development. And then eventually we have to come back again to see the kind of synergies that can be created with them. And it might be too late. So the earlier we start, the better. Before I close, so this is pretty much the presentation, but before I close, I would like to take your opinion on some few um, recommendations as to what our district assemblies can do to effectively and meaningfully contribute to poverty reduction. So while we go through the um, second section of this program, which is the Q&A, um, you can kindly scan this code and let me know your thoughts 
on why you think can be done for district assemblies to be more effective to meaningfully contribute to poverty reduction. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I, look if, I look forward to your contribution. Um, over to you, Adwa. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sekojo, for your presentation. I, it was a great one. I enjoyed listening to it. Um, I mean, the evidence is there that creating more districts not necessarily um, reduce poverty unless a lot of um, these um, suggestions and recommendations are probably put in place. So thank you. Now the floor is open for questions and answers. Um, you can raise your hand and I can call you, but I'll start with the questions in the chat. I think that there was a question from Piquet Sapon and he asked, um, I don't know there's a woman, but I'm saying he, he or she asked um, that in the Ghanaian context, what are the kinds of competition that one could envision among districts? I think you highlighted on some of them, but maybe you can get into a lot more of the details. And then also Gavina Ose also says that great presentation, um, Dr. Osekojo, my question is looking a bit ahead to see how politically feasible it will be to not keep increasing the number of districts as population increases. And what are the political benefits of halting or slowing down district creation in the country, assuming governments cannot increase transfers? Um, so maybe we can take these two questions and then I can go on to the third one. Over to you, Victor. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the like, um, very interesting question. So the first one on the contest, the kind of competition that we could envisage among the districts is about creating a kind of market that will attract people to your district. So the idea is that every district should some way figure out what it, is, it has a comparative advantage over. If we think of a situation like um, Kumasi and then Ejusu, Kumasi is pretty much a commercial town and Ejusu can offer a um, kind of a dormitory assistance or a dormitory town where you know, people will move from that area to go work in uh, um, uh, Kumasi. So the competitive advantage that Ejusu would have would be something in housing. So if the district identify this and then invest in housing, then they are going to pull a lot of people to come live in that area because of the proximity that they have with this um, big metropolitan area. So these are one, this is just one example. They are also cultural and then tourism aspects in some of the districts that they can leverage on, but we are not really highlighting these to push people to come to our area. So when it comes to competition, this is what I mean by competition. We can um, build on the competitive advantages that we have in each district to attract people to come live in this district. The key thing here is that the more people you have in a district, the more revenue you can generate because then you get more property tax, you get more market tax and all those kind of things. And development is driven by the resources that you are able to pull. So being competitive, it can be in different ways, but it should be on the competitive advantage of every district. In terms of what is feasible uh, to halt the creation of new district, I think that should be the way to go. Interestingly, if you look at the trend of creation of the district, you realize that the number of metropolitan areas has remained significantly the same, six. While the number of municipal and then, um, district assemblies keeps increasing. So if we are in the business of creating more districts, why are we not interested in creating more metropolitan assemblies? Because if population increases, then we can pull together some districts. If they have this enough population, I think in this case, over 250,000, we can pull them together to become a metropolitan area instead of creating more districts out of districts. Uh, the other thing is, what is the political benefits of halting or slowing down district creation? I think the political benefit is that one, you are able to uh, manage the central government grants that goes to the districts more um, efficiently. The more you create, the national king is not getting any bigger. So the more districts you create, the less revenue that they get. So if we are 10 and then we have maybe 10 cities to share, everybody gets one. But imagine if we become 20 districts, then everybody gets 0.5 of it. 
And uh, in the first place, this central government grant is not enough. So imagine we creating more and making it less. So the good argument or the argument here is that we should stop it, we should halt it, and then try to focus on what we have already, try to build their capacities and try to ensure that they are developing instead of creating ones, new ones every time. I think those are my um, answers to the first two questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think there's a question, the third one from Isa Musa. Thanks for the opportunity. This presentation is very insightful. I need clarifications on this. What indicator was used to determine poverty among different MMDAs, either within a region or across regions, since poverty is multidimensional in that decentralization wasn't able to reduce poverty? Emphasize on the indicator of the poverty determination. And then also, I think he's asking what accounted for the fact that poverty is higher in rural districts than urban districts. So thank you very much, Issa, for the question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So the indicator that we use for poverty is the poverty headcount. So this is income poverty. I know there are different measures of poverty. We have the um, income dimension, and then we have the multidimensional poverty, which looks like education and all those factors. But the poverty measure that we use for this particular estimation was poverty headcount. I hope that addresses the question. Uh, and the second one was what accounted for the fact that poverty is higher in rural districts than in urban districts? Uh, this is a very good question, but I think the simple answer to it is that in the rural areas, they are not able to generate enough um, economic activities in there. So less economic activities, less income, mean you are going to live under less than a dollar a day. So that is the main reason why districts are poorer than the urban areas. But this is only in relative terms. So because of the number of people in rural areas, in percentage terms, if we say 90%, it's still a significant value, but maybe a 10% in an urban area might outweigh the absolute number that is in the rural area. What we find doesn't say that there's no poverty in the urban district. There is poverty in there, but this is more um, severe in the rural districts when compared to the urban areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can raise your hand and I can call you to ask your question, but um, let me see if there's another one from Henrietta. <clears throat> um, thanks for the great presentation. Do you think having decentralized government where regions operate independently, that is collects their own taxes outside of the central government could help with poverty reduction in the district? Districts have to rely heavily on the central government for revenue source may be a contributing factor. Indeed, uh, Marita, I think the utmost form of decentralization is devolution, and that is where you can have our districts collecting their own kind of taxes. But there is a reason in Ghana why we don't have a full devolution of fiscal decentralization yet. And historically, that has been the fear of succession. So the problem was that if we give the regions more authority, we might not have a coherent or a joint kind of country as we have now. So there would be the tendency that, okay, my region has more resources, so why can't my region become a country on its own? That has been one of the fears that we've not been able to historically move to the utmost form of decentralization, which would have been ideal. And also, it's also political. So if the government pulls everything to the district assemblies, then what will be the role of the government? So the government, for some reason, holds on to these resources so that it keeps the government relevant. There's a justification for this. And uh, gradually, we're trying to move towards the idea of um, utmost fiscal decentralization. But as it stands now, our decentralization is far off achieving that um, higher level of fiscal decentralization that we have in countries like South Africa, where every district have their own kind of police, they collect their own revenue, they manage their own uh, resources and stuff. We do not have that yet. And if we're able to do that, I think that would be ideal. The problem is that if you look at that situation, it will mean changing a lot of laws and it will take a lot of years for us to reach that level. So what we can actually do right now is to move towards some form of voluntary cooperation where you know districts can work together 
to implement you know bigger projects or to undertake interventions that will lead to greater poverty reduction than the um, minor or I would say incremental project interventions that our districts are having. And also one argument with the central or the regional government is that personally, I feel it would be a good deal if we give the regions more responsibility when it comes to development. Recently, if you look at um, Greater Accra, the regional minister, I think he had in you could see the kind of um, impact that he's having on the region. But practically, what our regions do are more ceremonial. So we've established regions with key staff, knowledgeable staff that can help development of the entire region. But they are just there receiving the president when he comes and not actually contributing to the um, organizing the district in uh, um, integrated kind of development. So we can leverage on the regions. Now we have 16. We can leverage on the regions that we have, their capacity, their resources to actually achieve some kind of integrated development. I think that would be the way to go, other than going a full fledged fiscal decentralization where, you know, districts will take their own taxes and stuff. I think that would take the longer term. That should be the ideal for the long term. But in the short term, I believe um, districts working together. And then the region is being key in development um, decisions should be the way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a hand up, um, George Dunfe, Dr. George Dunfe, please. You can go ahead with your question. Yeah, Dr. Japon, thank, thanks very much. And uh, Dr. Kwejo, uh, what's the other name? Um, forgive me, I remember what it for you. Thanks so much for, for, for that beautiful presentation. Yeah, but I have a few issues. One has to do with your explanation as, uh, as when um, the number of the districts become money, the money becomes smaller. And so the question I was asking myself is this simple thing. Assuming we were to have uh, only four districts in Ghana and the total, I mean, uh, so um, this was another common fund, 5% uh, of it is supposed to be shared. Um, sorry, the total, I mean, fact and all, the total um, revenue generated in the country in a year is supposed to be shared among the districts. And so by a formula that is determined by and the parliament. And so, for example, if uh, that money for a year has been to be 100 cities, and we have only four districts in Ghana, each of them is going to take 25 cities, yes. right? Yes. But uh, if the districts are divided into uh, 10, then it means each of them is going to get 10. Is it the 25 and 10 that you are looking at it uh, as, as a 10 being smaller? I don't see it that way because the 10 that now has become smaller, is going to take care of the needs of a smaller group of people than the 25. And uh, poverty in Ghana we, we, uh, has always been, uh, you know, seen as the rural phenomena. And so if uh, you create more districts, and uh, what would that be a very big I mean, rural district? Has not been divided. I think we are going to get more uh, of the of the national kick than uh, I mean previously. And so I have a little bit of uh, challenge understanding that particular uh, explanation you gave. I get another thing I wanted you to also check had to do with the income. You talked about the fact that the hair count that you did the poverty high and hair count that you did. Um, you 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 use the income. I'm afraid uh, uh, here is consumption expenditure. As a, is it no consumption expenditure that you're talking about? So Ghana social service to use consumption expenditure. Income is really very difficult for us to use in this part of our world, measuring poverty. And so I don't know whether you you you, you meant to say consumption expenditure instead of income. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dunfe. And I think I totally agree with you on the point of you know. Uh, it's better at least that everybody eats than you know some few people eating. But the challenge that I have with you know the fragmentation is that in the example that you gave, if everybody gets 10, it's meaningful, but what much can the 10 do? The challenge with our poverty or our development is that we are not able to invest in critical infrastructure. So it can build a borehole, that is fine. It will reduce some level of poverty. But if we have these values in bigger amounts, then we can take off more of um, a network kind of pipe system that can go through, uh, cover all the rural areas that would even get that smaller values. My problem is that if you have the values in smaller amounts, you're, not, you're able to make a change, but you only make an incremental change. 
you're not able to make significant development interventions. So if you look at the flooding situation in Accra, for instance, you would actually argue for a more engineered kind of drainage system, but that's not what we have. The money that we have is able to, you know, construct U-shaped drains and, you know, smaller gutters here and there to ease the situation, but not necessarily address it. And that all boils down to the amount of money that we have to actually get into this. So I wouldn't discredit the fact that you, the smaller amounts can also give some relief. But I think going forward, if we really want to have a systematic development, then we should think of the bigger picture when it comes to investment in this kind of critical infrastructure. In terms of the poverty um, indicator that was used, I think this came from uh, a specific survey that was done by the Ghana Statistical Service, and it wasn't on consumption. I stand to be corrected, but I don't think it was on consumption. It was on income. Um, that survey was done once, and uh, the last time I used this um, data, I've not seen the Ghana Statistical Service coming up with it again, which is also quite a downside to understanding you know, the district dynamics because it's very difficult to get data at the district level. This happened to be the only readily available data I could use. And uh, yeah, I think it gives a good indication of the poverty situation. Uh, there was poverty headcount and then poverty intensity, and it wasn't based only on um, consumption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah, Adora, can I, yes. can I, can I uh, yes. come back quickly? Yes, you can yeah, come so, back. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Doc, yeah, you may be right, but I'm also wondering whether Ghana has done, uh, you use the uh, income approach. I know, I don't know whether you, it's the jealousy that you use. Otherwise, that is consumption expenditure approach that they use. And this part of our way, we have serious issues when it comes to income as, a, as, a, as an indicator for measurement of army public. And so we, we rely mostly on consumption and expenditure, uh, which to me is even superior to income. And Ghana Sascar Service does that. And that is based on that, that is why today we say income poverty is 23.4% for the country. It is 2% for Ghana area and those kind of things. That is the, the last one, seventh and the run of our Ghana Living Standard Survey. And so mm -hmm. maybe you want to check that again, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunfer. Are there any more questions? Y yes, I have a question. Okay. My name is Siafa Kamara, and I'm working for St. Ghana. I want to thank uh, Dr. Kojo for confirming uh, at least my own view about the creation of districts. And I've worked in Northern Ghana for 30 years. So I pretty much share his view that creation of smaller units only pose more challenge to those smaller units in terms of development. But I'd like to look at it from a different point of view, which is that um, in Northern Ghana, for example, if you go with the argument, you have a situation where there are marginalized groups smaller ethnic groups, smaller units, who, if they are put in a bigger unit, will have no voice. So the other argument is that since we are talking about growing democracy, is it not also a good thing that uh, you create smaller units that allow uh, different groups to be able to have a say to be able to have a voice. When you come to Accra, as you correctly said, that in a bigger unit, then those who have bigger voice, those who have bigger culture, they tend to dominate. In a democracy, you want to give everybody a shot, a leadership at a local level. So I don't know, I might agree with your data and everything you say, I share it, but that's the argument that I'm often con confronted with that smaller units are better for building a democratic culture. I totally agree with you on, on this one. So for me, I think um, the issue then comes with how we deal with the, uh, collaborative governance approaches. 
if the nation is generally a democratic state, then if you're having challenges at the local level, I believe then we should look at the managerial aspects when it comes to the running of our districts. When people are marginalized, I believe it goes beyond um, the fact that you know giving them district status make them all of a sudden significant or all of a sudden independent or all of a sudden give them the voice to you know express what they want. To some extent, yes, they would having their own district give them the unique voice that they can use to dictate their own kind of development. But if our districts are properly managed, I think we would be able to find ways to draw everybody in and not kind of um, discriminate or isolate people from uh, voicing out their concerns or taking part in leadership. So I would actually push this down to the management of our district. Then again, if we have it in a more competitive way, if everybody has to vote irrespective of the number that they have, then at least they will have a voice in controlling what can happen in their area and whatnot. So one way to possibly overcome that is the new you know, trend of um, trying to make our district um, leaders being elected rather than being appointed. If you are the manager and you need the votes of the, I mean, you will need the vote of everybody. So you have to go down to even the minority groups to seek their opinion or, or to address their um, demands. So I think that will be the way out. We can uh, address this looking at more of the managerial aspect of district assembly or district governance than creating new districts. I feel when we create it and then they don't have the resources, I mean, money is voice. If we create a new district and they don't have the money, they are still going to have no voice irrespective. That's my opinion. Okay, can I, can I make a comeback quickly? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not sure whether I share that opinion because in a democracy, okay, let's go back to what the district assembly were supposed to do. The district assembly are for local development. So I think that for me, the problem is more with the Ghanaian political leadership, and I guess in many African countries, is that if the idea is that, say for example, the northern in northern Ghana, I have argued in many ways that the formula that is used to allocate development resources is the problem. Because Greater Accra or the, the Metropolitan have a lot more flexibility in, in raising resources. So part of leadership is to make sure that those places that uh, do not have the natural resources, how do we ensure that we invest more in them as a collective? To me, that's a better way to approach it than to say that uh, decentralizing more, you know, is rather uh, creating a problem for the poor. I think that the problem is more pol political in the sense that in Ghana, uh, take the school feeding program, it was meant to support education of the poor, but then it became national. So I think that the problem is more to do with the political choices that our politicians make in terms of resource allocation. So if resource allocation for poverty reduction is driven purely by population, then it doesn't serve the real purpose for development, you know, because development resources should be based on the poverty index. Those who are poor, it will, edu it will educate them better. It will give them better education. It will help the totality. That for me is a problem. So I don't just see it as a material issue. I see it more as a political issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just totally agree with you on that. Action. I mean, this also makes me think about the fact that we've created more regions and then I've been wondering how you how do you see that, you know, in, in relation to the whole idea of, you know, district assemblies not also being able to perform. You're putting me in a very tight corner here. But with the creation of the new regions from 10 to 16, you have a social political benefit of it. We cannot discount that. 
But aside from that, aside the social political benefits, I don't see the economic benefit of having more regions created. Social politically, it makes sense, you know, like the OT region and then, you know, separation of the savannah. I mean, there is a good social political reason why these are created. So it depends on the angle that we want to um, proceed as a country. Do you want social political development or do you want economic development? If you want economic development, there are some sacrifices that we have to make. And if you want a social political development, then we have a particular path that we can talk to achieve that. So that will be the way I kind of um, shift away from uh, <laughs> the debate on the creation of the new regions to say, I think the justification was more based on social political reasons than economic reasons. Okay, so then we can confidently say that we can we should not expect any strong poverty reduction in, impact from from the creation of the of, of the new regions. Can we say that boldly? Anyway, so um, are there any more questions? I have one question I can ask, but just before that, are there any more questions? Okay, Victor, I've been wondering how do we, so we talk about competition and we talk about, you know, how that can create, in, like, you know, um, increased development and all of that. But I've been wondering, we also know that resources are like the endowments within the country, geographically, economically, it's not the same. So just as the Saifa Kamara was talking about, how do we, how do we envision competition in, um, in a healthy way and in a beneficial way when like you know different districts are differently endowed um, i think um the first step i would like to acknowledge cypher's um, recommendation that you know the distribution of the national resources should align with need more than population i think i share with that opinion the other bit about the um, competition aspect is that Irrespective of the type of district that you're working in, they all have their comparative advantages. So when you look at some districts, they are very culturally rich. We can exploit that cultural aspect to improve the, the um, situation in that district. Some other districts also are very well endowed when it comes to agriculture. So you should kind of have a, an occupation for a district so that they can thrive. In different countries, that is what is being done. Some municipalities are industrial municipalities. Some municipalities are mainly for tourism. Some municipalities are mainly for services. We can create our districts or we can build our district based on the kind of trade that is predominant in those areas and leverage that as a basis to you know, generate more revenue. One key of them is um, uh, um, tourism. Most of the districts are very rich in uh, tourist site or tourist attraction areas that we can leverage, but we are not doing that. So I feel we should just have a way to identify the key, you know, um, economic activity that holds a district and then use that as a leverage to create that kind of competition. And then again, it should be a basis in how we create our district. We shouldn't create district for the creation's sake. We should create it because we feel or we have an assessment of the possible endowment that we can generate from them. If that is the case, then we can gain something from the district. If not, and if you just create by just looking on the map and politically trying to see which constituencies will possibly come from this or that, then we are not going to make any headways with that. Okay, thank you. I mean, this also makes me think around the district league table and whether or not they are even kind of, you know, they've been designed in, in this way. Because for example, if there's a generic league table or tool for assessment and then some are going to feel that they are not doing well because maybe we are using like you know measures or tools that are not particularly um, um relevant for some specific district okay are there any more questions um we have two more minutes um maybe i can ask okay is there a question here evidence shows that creating and reorganizing regions haven't impacted poverty reduction. For example, the Upper West region remains the poorest region in Ghana, though it was separated from the upper regions in 1987 to promote development. Therefore, we can't expect an automatic change with the creation of districts. The way the districts or regions are 
created to make us believe it's just for political expediency, not for development necessarily. Okay, thank you. I totally agree with you, Isa. <laughs> if you're talking about social political development, then 100%, but if you're talking of economic, totally not. Okay, and um, we'll take the last question from Charles. Hi, good afternoon and thanks very much for the opportunity. I just um, uh, got a sense of some discussion about the, the, how we make the districts more productive and whether we can align uh, the resources that they have as part of the poverty reduction agenda, which is fantastic. I've been saying all along that um, we should make the district operate as businesses, that they should operate as businesses. Uh, unfortunately, the political um, the nature of how the chief executives are appointed, how the assemblies are run, don't really give that opportunity for that kind of thinking around operating the district as a business. And then also because some of the major sectors have not been truly, truly decentralized, like health and education, they are still under the uh, national level uh, centralized from Accra. So how does a district manage its own resources within itself by itself and then make sure that it does uh, cut its coat according to its size? Um, so there are so many issues. Unfortunately, I came a bit late. Otherwise, I would have... Um, you mentioned the district league table because uh, I'm with, with UNICEF and uh, the focal person for this uh, initiative. Um, it is... It started as more as a social accountability to, to generate ideas about information about how, where we can find districts that are low uh, in terms of development. Uh, it is still going up. We've moved from six indicators to seven indicators to nine. And the last time, last year, we had 19, 17 indicators. So it is trying to show uh, the disparities and inequalities among districts and draw attention to all stakeholders, Ministry of Finance, the Office of the President, Parliament, as to how to target development and to sort of achieve more equitable resource allocation and development across the country. So uh, in future, we are thinking of adding more some economic indicators. It will take time because we are not doing it um, in, but through surveys. We are doing it through administrative data. And economic data is very difficult to come by uh, in Ghana in terms of employment and all that. So that is where we are now. And uh, we will talk, I can have a chat, uh, anyone who wants more information about the digital table. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Very insightful. Dr. Victor Sekoja, would you like to have some final <laughs> words? before we close the meeting? Um, I think for our final, I think I'm very happy with this session and I'm very happy to, you know, have this discussion with um, like-minded people and to discuss, you know, the issues of decentralization. Um, I wish that going forward, we were able to be able to transmit or translate our ideas to actually influence policy and then decisions in the, how our districts are managed, particularly when it comes to the management of the districts, like the creation, um, the election of the mayors. Ideally, if you have real managers at the helm of affairs, then there would be more accountability or there would be more expectations. Um, a real manager will have goals that they want to achieve. So if you all believe this is going to work, then I think we should find a way, come together, work together and try to push the agenda and make sure that um, we make decentralization more meaningful to poverty reduction than it is right now. I think that will be my last words. Thank you very much for the presentation. I will be going home with um, you know, the need for targeted resource allocation. I think it's very important as we, we have um, heard here. So to all of you who joined us, we are very grateful for joining and thank you Dr. Vitor Sekojo for making time for this presentation and we will invite you to subsequent meetings. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.